Good morning from Toronto, Canada. My name is Armin Mulkey, and along with my colleague uh, Ariane Panna, we'd like to welcome you to uh, another live uh, Kwanzaa user webinar. Um, as you know, in this uh, webinar series, we highlight the works of academics from around the world who rely on Kwanzaa solutions and technologies as part of their research. Uh, today, we're very super, or very excited, super excited to have a great friend of Kwanzaa, Dr. Jeremy uh, Brown from uh, Johns Hopkins University, um, um, my home state of Maryland, to discuss his research on haptic interaction design for telerobotic um, devices. Um, Aryan, would you kindly um, introduce uh, today's uh, guest speaker? Thanks, Arman. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good night, everyone, depending on uh, where, where you are in the world. Uh, thank you for joining us on another great user Quanser webinar presented by Dr. Brown, uh, one of Quanser's uh, amazing clients that I've personally had the pleasure of working with. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Brown is the uh, John Mellon Assistant Professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Johns Hopkins University, where he directs the Haptics and Medical Robotics, uh, also known as HAMR uh, lab. He's also a member of the Lab for Computational Sensing and Robotics, um, known as LCSR, and uh, the Mellon Center for Engineering in Healthcare. Prior to joining Johns Hopkins, uh, Dr. Brown was a postdoc research fellow at University of Pennsylvania in Haptic Research Group, which is a part of uh, Penn's general robotics, automation, sensing, and perception, known as uh, GRASP uh, Lab, or GRASP. Uh, and the University of Michigan as well, respectively, as a graduate of uh, the Atlanta University Center's dual degree engineering program. Uh, Dr. Brown's team uses method from human perception, motor control, neurophysiology, and biomechanics to study the human perception of uh, touch, especially as it relates to the application of human robot interaction and collaboration. He has been honored to receive uh, several awards, including the National Science Foundation uh, Graduate Research Fellowship, the Best Student uh, Paper Award at the 2012 IEEE Haptic Symposium, the Penn um, University of Pennsylvania's Postdoc Fellowship um, for Academic uh, Diversity, and the NSF CRII Award. Uh, he was also recently named a scholar uh, to the NIH-funded Interdisciplinary Rehabilitation Engineering Career Development Program, IREK-12. He is a member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering, Robotics, and Automation Society uh, uh, as a part of IEEE, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, or ASME, and the National Society of uh, Black Engineers, NSBE. Brown's work uh, has appeared in several uh, peer-reviewed journals, including the Journal of uh, Neuroengineering and Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation, IEEE Transaction on Haptics, IEEE Transactions on Biomedical Engineering, and IEEE Transaction on Neural Systems and Rehabilitation Engineering, and IEEE Transactions on uh, Medical Robotics and Bionics. Um, very impressive background and uh, bio, Dr. Brown. So as you all can tell, um, Dr. Brown has a lot to share with us and we all are very excited uh, to hear. Thank you everyone again for joining and Dr. Brown, it's all yours. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, um, uh, Arian, for that, uh, that wonderful introduction. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, Arman, as well, for, for kicking us off. Um, I am a little bit new to the go to meeting, so give me a second to try and get everything set up uh, as it should be so that I can share uh, my screen. Uh, let's see here. Oops, sorry, wrong window. Let's do this one. Okay. Um, Let's see. I think we are up and running. Um, perfect, Armand, can yep. you just give me a? Yep. It's it's yep. up. Okay. Perfect. Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, so uh, um, you know, as as Arya mentioned, my name is Jeremy Brown. I'm an uh, assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering uh, here at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm a member of the Laboratory for Computational Sensing and Robotics (LCSR), the Malone Center for Engineering and Healthcare, uh, and I direct the Haptics and Medical Robotics Laboratory, or as we like to call it, the Hammer Lab. Um, uh, the name Hammer comes as a little ode to uh, my father, who's a carpenter by trade. Uh, um, I ended up not going into carpentry. I ended up doing engineering, but I at least uh, always carry a hammer with me. 
Uh, and so that's kind of where that name came from. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in our lab kind of over the last couple of years in relation to haptic interaction design, mainly for telerobotic uh, scenarios. Uh, and so to start this talk, I'm, you know, going to, you know, maybe begin with the assumption uh, that not everybody in the room is uh, maybe familiar with uh, teleoperation and, and telerobotics. Uh, and so as a primer, uh, you know, I will basically start with something that we are all familiar with. Um, and this is our ability to use our, our limbs, in particular our upper extremity, um, to do dexterous manipulation. Um, as you can see from the various pictures here, um, you know, we do a lot of tasks that require fine level manipulation, um, you know, uh, high levels of precision when it comes to position, high levels of precision when it comes to force. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, we do tasks that require very slow, precise movements, fast that require more ballistic movements. Um, you know, but in general, our limbs are uniquely designed and our control system kind of from our central nervous system out to our periphery, uh, sensory motor control is uniquely designed to do this fine level uh, motor control or, or what, what we refer to in our lab oftentimes as dexterous manipulation. Well, the problem is that there are a number of scenarios uh, where, let's say, the environment that we want to do the dexterous manipulation in um, just is not suitable. Um, and that's either because the environment is located at great distances from where we are, right? Um, and so we're talking, you know, uh, a distance issue. Uh, the environment poses hazards uh, to our body in some way. Um, uh, the, the environment is maybe on a different scale than our, our bodies, um, or we've, in, in, our, in some sense, contrived limitations uh, to being able to access the environment, as in the case case of minimally invasive surgery uh, that you see in the, uh, in the bottom right picture. Um, there are also scenarios where the body itself is changed, uh, um, as in the case of an amputation. Uh, and there, what we're trying to do is actually restore the ability to interact with the natural environment um, like we do with our healthy, intact limbs. Well, in either of these scenarios, what you need uh, is an interface that basically takes the intent that we're trying to carry out on the environment and does that uh, or acts on the environment on our behalf. Um, these uh, interfaces uh, historically have been called teleoperators, um, and I'll show you an example of one of the earlier or earlier teleoperators uh, here in this video um, that was developed by a researcher by the name of Raymond Gertz in the 1950s um, to be able to allow uh, operators to be able to handle radioactive material without having to physically touch that material uh, themselves. Now, what's interesting about the Gertz teleoperator um, is that it's purely mechanical. It's just cables and linkages that uh, link the side that the operator controls, which you call the leader, uh, to the side that's actually handling the radioactive material, which is referred to as the follower. Um, because it's a purely mechanical system, and it, uh, I'll come back to this a little bit later on in my talk, um, there's inherent what we call force reflection. Right. If the operator bumps into something on the uh, environment side, uh, you know, they feel that uh, because that mechanical uh, um, interaction is transmitted uh, through the device itself back to the operator's limb. So there's inherent what we call haptic feedback. Uh, and so uh, this is really important when we talk about pure mechanical teleoperators. Unfortunately, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but you know, nowadays most uh, you know teleoperators are actually not these pure uh, mechanical teleoperators. Um, they're actually uh, telerobots. Um, you know, because of the advances in actuators and sensing technology now, we've gotten rid of these just pure cable linkage systems uh, and moved to more sensor, wireless, or tethered uh, sensor actuator kind of robotic designs. Um, what that has done, though, is that uh, because we can, you know, because we can build these robotic systems that can accurately measure the user's position and things like that, we can accurately map what the user wants to do on the environment. Right. Um, uh, and um, likewise, because these robots generally have a suite of sensors on them, we can measure all of the interactions between the robot and the environment. Unfortunately, as it stands right now with most telerobots, though, that information doesn't get passed back to the operator. And so they're missing that haptic information that is key to being able to enable and allow dexterous manipulation. 
Uh, and so what we focus on in my lab and what a lot, what a lot of other researchers in the haptics community focus on are designing and developing these haptic interfaces that take that information, the intera physical interactions between the robot and the environment and pass that information back to the operator so that they can close the loop now when it comes to dexterous manipulation. Unfortunately though, when we look at the state of current haptic interfaces for most telerobotic devices though, uh, the haptic information is either not existent and I'll talk about some examples where that is the case, um, or if it does exist, the, the if fidelity is not great, is not that great. And so you're still struggling to get the information that's needed to be able to, again, close that sensory motor loop and do dexterous manipulation. Okay, um, so that's kind of my primer on uh, teleoperation and telerobotics. I hope everyone at this point is kind of up to speed with the field of teleoperation and telerobotics enough to understand some of the applications that I'm gonna talk about going forward. Um, I'm gonna talk about three different research areas that my lab is focusing on. This is not um, all inclusive of the research that we do, but this kind of captures the big three you know, major thrusts in my, in my research group. Um, the first one that I'm gonna focus in on is uh, fundamental haptic perception. I mean, the reason we focus in on this is because of all of our senses, um, you know, in particular those that are used uh, for uh, volitional control, vision, audition, and, and touch. Touch is the one that we understand the least. Uh, and so a lot of my work in our lab is actually trying to understand just the fundamental basics of how we perceive the world around us. How do we understand the physics of the world and use that to develop a perception um, of the physical environment? And so this is some work being done by uh, my uh, graduate student, Mohit Sangala. Um, so um, kind of, as I said, you know, touch is again something that we don't fully understand um, completely. Um, and so we kind of add this question, well, let's say I've got this uh, block this uh, in the world, this orange block that you see, and you go out and you grab this block with your left hand. Um, I'm, you know, what happens when you touch that block is uh, that information leads to a perception of the block. You develop this percept of the block. I teach a haptics class every semester or every fall semester. Um, and one of the first exercises I do is I hand out this, we call it the haptic box, it's just basically a cardboard box with a bunch of objects in it um, and a little hole cut in it. The students have to reach inside um, and basically feel around and see if they can recognize the objects. And just through touch alone, um, in this process called stereognosis, we're really good at understanding and, and re you know, um, identifying and coming up with perceptions of objects pure, you know, based purely on the haptic interactions, the senses that we get um, through, through our haptic sensors. So you know, what happens now when you grab this block with, this, uh, with your left hand, you develop a percept or a perception of the block. Well, what happens now if I grab that same block with the other hand, my right hand? The question becomes, is the perception that I develop between left and right exactly the same? Do I perceive the block in my left hand with my left hand to be exactly the same as the block that I uh, touch with my right hand? Um, and so we kind of went out to test this concept. Um, and what we did is we developed just a simple uh, uh, haptic interface here, single degree of freedom, direct drive interface uh, with a DC motor and encoder um, and an input uh, for the hand. Um, and I will just, you know, kind of throughout this talk, I'll kind of show you some of the, uh, because, you know, again, this is, is, is a quantum webinar, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, where we use a lot of the quantum uh, technologies. Um, and in this case, what we're using here um, is to, to do this, uh, to, to run this system is a Cupid E uh, data acquisition board along with uh, an Ampac L4 linear amplifier. And then of course, all of these things are wrapped together uh, with the Quark uh, MATLAB, simul uh, MATLAB simulate block set. So um, what we did with this single degree of freedom device is we basically rendered what's called a virtual spring, right? And so a virtual spring, just like a regular spring, follows a Hooke's law formulation. I take the angular displacement, multiply it by some constant k, uh, and what I get out is a torque that is proportional to the input displacement. Um, this video that, I'm, that you're going to see is actually an example of that. And what you saw in these two videos is that the blue trace here is the angular displacement. Um, so the participant rotated their hand uh, roughly to about 90 degrees and back. Um, but what we did is in between those two individual displacements, we changed the parameter K. It went from a very high K value, which is why the torque uh, goes up uh, pretty high to a, to a lower K value, which is why for the same displacement, you get a different uh, you know, maximum torque. And this works just like any, any physical spring in the real world with a um, you know, variable uh, um, you know, with a different spring constant. Um, so now what we can do uh, with this is we uh, we got this ability to render these virtual springs. Um, and so what we do is we actually built two of these setups, one for the left hand and one for the right. Um, it, it, they're exactly identical in terms of uh, the hardware. Um, both of these, again, are run through the same data acquisition board and, and control software. But we run an experiment 
um, where essentially we present, um, um, we do it for the left hand and then we do it for the right hand. Um, we present two springs of different spring constants and we use a, what's called a psychophysical uh, approach, uh, the method of constant stimuli, where we give participants two pairs of springs and we ask them at any given time uh, to basically say which of the two springs was stiffest uh, or stiffer, I should say. Um, and it's a it's a you know very common uh, psychometric or psychophysics psychophysics approach um, um, that we're using a two alternative force choice or two interval to an alternative force choice uh, paradigm. Um, and what you get back are these psychometric curves. This is a um, an example of a psychometric curve for one representative participant here. Um, and what you see kind of very obviously is that the psychometric function uh, that we fit to the data points looks different for the left hand than it does for the right hand. Um, what you're seeing on the, the the y-axis here is basically the proportion of uh, time that the user said, uh, you know, uh, the correct spring was stiffer um, or a, a given spring was stiffer. And then um, you were looking at um, on the on the x-axis, the actual spring constant values. Um, and so what we then do is compare with, uh, um, you know, we compare these thresholds essentially uh, between the left and the right hand. Um, and essentially what we found is that uh, for this group of participants, and here we did, a, I think the study was about 12 participants, that they actually perceived the springs differently. They perceived, or I should say, their ability to uh, differentiate between springs that were closer together in terms of their K value was greater for your left hand than it was for your right. So the left hand here is actually more sensitive. Um, and this is what we call a perceptual asymmetry. Um, there have been perceptual asymmetries that have been found in the literature elsewhere for, uh, um, you know, other uh, haptic uh, uh, modalities like shape perception. Um, but this is the first time that we've shown that there is also a perceptual asymmetry that exists uh, between the hands for a kinesthetic cue um, when it involves stiffness. Um, and so it's interesting to note here that this uh, participant pool was all right hand dominant. Um, and so for a right hand dominant participant pool, we found that the left hand was actually, you know, um, uh, more sensitive than the right hand. Now, not necessarily saying this is related to handedness. We've still got further studies to do. Um, in fact, doing the exact same study with the left hand dominant participant. But as a left hand individual, left hand dominant individual, I can say that there's early there's there's we've got some preliminary evidence now to suggest that this result still even holds for a left hand dominant uh, participant pool. So it may not be a hand dominance effect that we're looking at. Um, and so, but again, more studies to, uh, to go in order to uh, be able to, to tease this apart. But at least we can say that, yes, for kinesthetic cues like stiffness perception, um, there is a perceptual asymmetry. Our hands don't perceive the world exactly, or the different sides of our body don't perceive the world exactly the same way. Um, this next study that I'm gonna talk about is, uh, you know, some more work that uh, Mohi um, has, has done. And this is actually, he's uh, actually presenting part of this later on today um, at the uh, IROS conference, IEEE IROS conference, virtually at least. Um, and it's looking more at uh, kind of broader looking at teleoperation and perception um, within teleoperation. And so if you remember from the GERTS teleoperator that I showed you before, you know, you, you have an operator who's operating uh, an input device that we refer to as the leader that then is driving the uh, output device, which is generally some robotic manipulator that we refer to as the follower. And it's operate, it's, it, it is, it's the follower that's interacting with objects in the environment. Um, well, the goal of good teleoperation, right, um, and there are you know, many papers, seminal papers on this, is to basically make the teleoperator disappear so that the user doesn't feel the teleoperator at all. What they feel is the environment as if they're interacting with the environment like they would with their natural intact limbs. Unfortunately, though, this goal is actually more of a theoretical ideal than a practical reality. Um, and so inevitably, most teleoperators are not transparent. In fact, most teleoperators actually introduce additional dynamics um, between the input and output or between the leader and follower. Um, and so you know, we were kind of interested in, from a perceptual design standpoint, what effect do these additional dynamics have that you introduce between the leader and the follower? And I should say that these dynamics come from the fact that for most telerobotic systems, um, you're typically using, you know, um, uh, actuators with some closed loop control design and something like a PID, a proportional integral derivative controller, actually adds uh, stiffness and damping um, um, into the actual um, um, into the actual system, uh, virtual stiffness, virtual damping into the system, and you can actually feel that. Um, you know, I should also say that um, even with the original teleoperator that I talked about before, the GERTS teleoperator, um, you know, 
all those all those cables and linkages, right? You imagine that there's friction in that system. You imagine that all those linkages, they're not massless, right? So you're carrying around the inertia of that system as well. So even the perfect, you know, or not the perfect, but the ideal kind of rigid mechanical teleoperator still has inherent dynamics. And we're kind of asking this question of, let's just assume the dynamics will always be there. What effect does that have on the operator's ability to perceive the environment? Uh, so in order to study this, we developed this, uh, what we call our teleoperator test bed. Um, I'll try to walk you through it very simply. Um, you have the input side uh, where you see the user's uh, uh, hand in going into the device. You have the output side, uh, which is, uh, um, you know, uh, again, or you have the environment, I should say, which is on the other side of that blue line where you see the number three. Um, we can replace that environment with either a motor and make it a virtual environment like a virtual spring, or we can move that motor out of the way and add actual physical environments to it. Um, and then in between those two blue uh, lines uh, with label two are different uh, teleoperator transmissions. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. This whole system, again, is run by uh, uh, Cupid EDAT. Uh, here in, uh, in AMPAC, again, an AMPAC L4 uh, amplifier, and every all of the control is done uh, in Quark. Um, uh, and so essentially what we have in that middle section, the kind of zoom in, um, is essentially four different types of transmissions, starting from the bottom and working my way up. We have a rigid transmission, which is just a pure rigid rod that connects the input and the output side. That's akin to uh, the GERTS teleoperator. And here, everything is just a single degree of freedom, right? So just rotation. Um, uh, um, in the uh, going up from the rigid transmission, we have your kind of standard telerobotic interface. We have two DC actuators. One is the input uh, or the leader uh, side of the robot. The other is the follower side of the robot. And those are closed to, again, like a PID or a PD loop, um, introducing the dynamics that come with closed loop control. Going above that is a damp transmission. So we took the rigid rod, broken, uh, cut it in the middle and put a rotary damper in between. So now we've got physical damping that we've added into the system. Um, uh, physical uh, viscous type of damping. Um, and then above that, um, we've taken the same, I mean, again, taken the rod, broken it in half and replaced it uh, with an elastic element now to give us an elastic transmission. Um, and this whole system is kind of coupled together through a series of capstan drives. Um, and we can uh, essentially, you know, uh, connect or disconnect any one of these or a couple any of these transmissions together at any point in time to kind of render any type of, let's say, dynamic transmission um, that we would want to be able to say, okay, for the same environment uh, that I'm, uh, that I on, you know, the same environment and the same input, as I change the transmission in the middle, what effect does that have on the user's ability uh, to perceive the dynamics of the environment? Or, uh, and, and or I should say, what ability or what effect does that have on the user's perception or their ability to perform a task um, in that, with that environment? Um, and so that's one of the questions that we're asking with this setup here. Um, I'll show you very quickly in this video, um, just an example of the input output uh, relationship here. So you'll see the user's hand rotate um, on the top graph on the right. Um, you'll see the input output torque because we've got two torque sensors on either side just to measure the interaction torques. Um, and on the bottom graph, you'll actually see the displacement from the input and the output side. Okay, um, so this is this was uh, you know it's maybe not as easy to tell because a, a lot of things are rotating in the um, in, in that video, but here the only thing that was actually connected was that rigid transmission, which is why we get pretty good you know really good tracking between input and output, right? There are almost no dynamics, um, at least no stiffness, no damping, um, you know, between the input and output sides because all we're doing is rotating that rigid rod, so we would expect to get pretty good tracking. Now, as we introduce different types of dynamics, as you can see here, um, you can see that the input output relationships actually change. When we have a damp transmission on the top left, just the pure elastic transmission on the bottom left, the combined damp plus elastic transmission in the top right, and then our electromechanical transmission um, in, in the bottom right. And so where we are right now with this study is we've now built the system, characterized the system, and we're beginning to uh, start running some experiments to see how do these different transmissions affect the user's ability to perform even a simple task, like a position tracking task? Okay, so that's a lot of the work that we're doing in the kind of fundamental haptic perception domain. Um, the next thing that I will talk about is the work that we've been doing in the upper limb prosthetic space. Um, and this is some work that's being done by my graduate student, uh, Neha Thomas, um, a former alum of the lab, Garrett Ung, um, and another lab, a former uh, alum of the uh, lab, Ethan Miller. Um, so, 
um, kind of the current state of upper limb prosthetic devices, uh, despite kind of all of the research that's been going in, uh, in into upper extremity prosthetics over the last, let's say, decade plus, um, there's still two kind of major main options, clinical prostheses, uh, that one, you know, an individual would get if, you know, you had an amputation today. The first one on the left is called a body power prosthesis, just to talk a little bit about that. This operates very similar to that Gertz teleoperator that I started off with. It's a pure mechanical system. Uh, the amputee wears a shoulder harness, there's a Bowden cable that links the uh, harness to the prosthetic prehensor or the prosthetic hand um, that pulling on the cable either causes the hand to open or causes the hand to close depending on the actuation scheme. What's nice about these uh, um, types of prostheses is that they have inherent haptic feedback, again, like that original Gertz teleoperator. Um, and that's just because of the pure mechanical linkage between, let's say, the output, which is the hand, and the input, which is the shoulder harness. The other type of prosthesis is a myoelectric prosthesis. Um, and this one basically uses surface uh, EMG electrodes over muscles in the residual limb to control a motorized uh, prosthetic hand. Um, what's nice about these devices is that you uh, can get added degrees of freedom. Body power devices are generally limited to single degree of freedom, just opening and closing of a hand. Um, myoelectric, you know, especially with uh, advanced um, pattern recognition technologies that have been, you know, kind of uh, the topic of research as of late, you can get control over multiple degrees of freedom. The downside of these myoelectric prostheses is that they don't provide any haptic feedback. And so the amputees don't have any sensory information about what's happening with their prosthesis. They're bo therefore forced to uh, rely very heavily on vision, what they can see, or maybe even auditory cues from the sound of the motor or what the, or the environment that they're interacting with. So um, what we set out to do in our lab, you know, is, is one of many labs that's been investigating this topic uh, for, uh, you know, for a number of years now um, is, um, you know, trying to understand what is the added utility of adding haptic feedback into uh, an upper extremity prosthesis. And we've shown evidence to suggest that adding haptic feedback does improve performance. Um, there are other labs that have shown that as well. Um, and so here, what we were interested in is saying, okay, well, if we know adding haptics does improve performance, what we want to now say is how does that compare to, let's say, not only a, a, a myoelectric prosthesis without haptic feedback, but the gold standard, our natural intact limbs, right? So um, we've kind of shown this, you know, increase from the uh, kind of clinical standard, but where are we in terms of like what the gold standard looks like? How close are we to replicating what the natural hand can do? Um, and we were interested in looking at this from two different perspectives. Uh, the first one is around, um, you know, uh, just a pure task performance, right? If I give you an object and tell you to squeeze it, can you measure the forces of interaction um, and use that to be able to perform the task? But then also we were interested in um, adding this haptic information, right? It could potentially make uh, it could make the task a lot easier to perform and therefore you don't have to think about it as much, or it could give you more information to have to think about and process and can make the task actually more difficult to perform. And so now we're interested in this element of cognitive load or mental effort, mental workload. Um, you know, you can perform the task better maybe, but at what cost? And so we're interested in, um, in, in measuring that. Um, and so in this study, uh, um, we did a very simple task. We have a prosthesis, a uh, single degree of freedom, what we call voluntary closing prosthesis uh, that uh, has a four sensor on the end. Um, it, this prosthesis is what we could call a mock prosthesis. So we use a lot, a lot of our prosthetics work. We actually work with non-amputees uh, because it's been um, shown that amputees and non-amputees in, in these mock prostheses have very co similar compensatory strategies. Uh, and so uh, we're, a lot, we're able to do a lot of basic science work around the utility of things like haptic feedback. But in this case, what we had is these three objects that you see in the top upper right hand corner that visually look roughly the same. We even put an additional cover over them so you couldn't see uh, exactly what they were. Um, but physically, they all are different stiffnesses, soft, medium, hard. Um, and so we ran this experiment where we asked participants kind of back to that, uh, um, you know, fundamental haptic perception work that we do, um, where we gave individuals two of these objects at any given time and asked them to tell us which one was stiffer, right? Um, and so I, we looked at both a, a standard myoelectric prosthesis without haptic feedback, a myoelectric prosthesis with haptic feedback, and then again, the intact can, the natural limb to see how well our participants performed it. We looked at task performance, so how accurate were they at identifying which of the objects or blocks was the stiffest. And then we also looked at 
again, this cognitive workload, and this is in collaboration with a colleague of mine, Hassan Ayaz, uh, at Drexel University, um, using a technique called functional near infrared spectroscopy, uh, which basically looks at the level of oxidated hemoglobin in the prefrontal cortex and can tie that to cognitive workload. Um, and for this experiment, uh, for this setup, again, we're using a Cupid E um, DAC as well as the uh, Quark um, interface here. Um, so I won't go through all of the results. Um, you know, uh, our, our paper um, uh, that's published in IEEE Transactions on Human Machine Systems, um, you know, kind of details all of our findings. I'll, I'll kind of hone in on one which we look at called neural efficiency. Um, and so you can think of neural efficiency as essentially, um, you know, kind of looking at how accurate you are at the task combined with how much mental effort it takes to do the task. So the higher the, in, the, in the efficiency, the more positive the value of the efficiency uh, shows that you can do the task very well without much mental effort. And so you can see from this big blue block on the left-hand side, the natural intact hand has the highest efficiency, right? We use our limbs all the time. Um, we have a lot of experience using our limbs, right? You know, from birth almost. Uh, and so um, you would expect that our natural intact limbs, again, the gold standard here, has the best efficiency, right? We can do a task very accurate and it doesn't take us much mental effort to do it. Now, the opposite is true uh, for our standard myoelectric prosthesis where you don't have haptic feedback. There, task performance and mental effort go down, right? And so you have a very negative, uh, um, almost an equal and opposite negative efficiency for your standard myoelectric prosthesis. But now in the middle, when we turned on the haptic feedback, and I forgot to mention, but I'll, I'll go back and say the haptic feedback that we use is we took the force uh, grip force that participants had, and we mapped that to a vibrating uh, actuator that participants wore on their upper upper arm. Um, you see that adding the haptic information back in, um, you know, significantly increases um, our neural efficiency um, over the the myoelectric prosthesis without haptic feedback. Um, we're still significantly less than what the hand is doing, but we're actually trending now in the right direction. So adding haptics into uh, an upper extremity prosthesis improves task performance, which we had already shown. It also decreases mental workload, which hadn't been necessarily shown with the direct neural imaging measure um, like FNIRS before. So we're getting better at improving neural efficiency with something, um, you know, by adding haptics in. Now I should say, you know, the difference between the intact limb and, and our prosthesis with happy feedback, there's still orders of magnitude difference now, right? Because we're taking, you know, one sensor and measuring force, whereas our intact limbs have, you know, thousands of sensors, you know, distributed throughout the skin in our hand, right? And so we're simplifying, we're, you know, uh, you know, or, you know, reducing the order of this, the sensing capabilities by orders of magnitude, but we're still getting this positive trend where added, this added haptic information improves task performance and also decreases the mental effort to do the task. Okay, um, this next project that I'm gonna talk about in a prosthetic space is actually some work done by uh, my student, Ethan Miller. Um, and it's motivated by the fact that when you look at advanced prosthetic limbs, here I'm showing the B-Bionic hand by Autobot, um, you can see very clearly that these hands are designed to really replicate uh, the form and function of our healthy intact, you know, natural limbs, right? Especially in terms of size and degrees of freedom. These hands can, you know, have the same number of degrees of freedom as our intact limb. Um, the difference though, is that most of these devices still use standard DC actuators um, to individually control each finger um, and, and, and highly geared DC actuators to be able to control the individuation um, of the joints um, at the finger. Now, our own intact limbs use a very different control scheme, right? We basically have tendons that run the length of our uh, fingers uh, that go through the wrist and uh, basically attach to muscles in our forearm. And so by flexing these muscles, what we typically refer to or group together as our flexors and extensors, I can separately control flexion of my hands as, all, as well as extension of my hands, right? Just by contracting the muscles on either side of the forearm. What's very interesting though, is that this, uh, what we call antagonist actuation scheme also allows us to do things like modulate the endpoint impedance or stiffness of the limbs. So if my if my muscles are pretty relaxed, and I'm maybe you can see it in the screen here, right? The fingers are very compliant. I can move them all around. But the minute I start co-contracting the muscles on either side of uh, my my antagonist muscle schemes, right? The the fingers get very stiff, right? That's something that we can't necessarily do with kind of current prosthesis uh, prosthetic hand technology, right? 
they always are generally high impedance devices, right? When you turn them off, they stay exactly where they are. Um, and we can't, we don't have this ability to lower the compliance or the impedance of the limb. So Ethan set out uh, to try and replicate that in a prosthesis. Now, let me say that there's been a lot of work um, in the field that has looked at tendon driven hands. Um, most of this work has either been looking at underactuated schemes where you're trying to just control flexion and you rely on kind of the elasticity of the joints to bring the, uh, to open the hand back up. Um, there have been other approaches that have looked at more biomimetic. Can we build a hand that actually has, you know, bone tendon structures to it? Um, and, um, you know, in, in this research, we'll have individual motors running to each tendon of the finger and, you know, that approach is really amazing. The problem is it's generally not something that you could wear. And so Ethan wanted to kind of solve both of these approaches. He wanted to be able to do individualized extension and flexion of the fingers, but also put it on a um, on an actual prosthesis that was that was wearable. Um, and so what you see here um, is the prosthesis that he developed in the lab. Um, I will kind of walk you through it. Um, there are two big tendons, there are two motors kind of at the back of the forearm here that um, um, pull on these tendon cables that then run through kind of the wrist joint of the hand and then span out to all of four fingers here. So essentially what we've done is we've simplified the problem. So instead of individually actuating each finger now, we have one tendon on each side that controls separately flexion and extension of the hand. We were interested also in this, with this new paradigm, you know, um, how do users know how much tension is in the cable at any given time? And so you, we've got these servo motors that are attached to these straps that the user wears underneath the prosthetic cup. They basically use a, um, a haptic display methodology called skin stretch to basically uh, provide haptic feedback around the amount of tension that's in the cable. Well, in this, uh, um, uh, um, in this video, I'm going to show you here what we did in, in this paper um, that Ethan wrote that was published in uh, International Symposium on Medical Robotics, um, is we were interested with this new kind of actuation paradigm. Well, how do we control this kind of device? This is very different than what standard, you know, myoelectric control looks like. Um, and so we came up with two different control um, uh, designs. One is called, uh, um, uh, you know, one is called uh, alpha, the other is called beta. I should say here that everything that Ethan did to control this device is run through uh, a Q8, which I'm not showing here, um, and also a quark interface. Um, but essentially, um, um, what we what we did is uh, we came up with two different control schemes and we did an evaluation to see which one worked better than the other. This video will show you both of them. Okay, so I'm not sure how, how clean the video was, whether it's smooth or choppy, but I'll try to walk you through it. The first one, again, is called Alpha, um, and it basically, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uses two, it's like a state machine uh, that uses two different states to control flexion and tension um, of the hand. The third, the second one is more of a threshold-based approach um, where you have to rise, you know, raise your EMG above certain thresholds to get the device to open or close. Um, the, um, as you can probably see from the task that we did, which is called box and blocks and box, or box and blocks, I should say the other way around, there's a box with blocks in it, and the goal is to move the blocks from one side of this partition to the other. Um, if you could see it, if not, I'll just have to elaborate here. Um, and if you go to the, uh, to the uh, IEEE Explorer, you can actually download the video uh, in the multimedia file to actually see it, you know, kind of on your uh, desktop run natively. Um, when the, whenever the user was putting a hand in the blocks, the hand was pretty compliant. And you could actually see the fingers just kind of, you know, flexing around until they decided to grab an object. And then they got tense around the object and allowed them to pick them up. And there was one section where as the user was bringing the hand back over, they actually hit the partition. And just like my hands are doing here, right, they kind of relax and move over the partition. Um, the hand there did that because they were in a very low impedance mode. That wouldn't happen with a standard myoelectric prosthesis. If the hand was rigid, you would actually just carry the partition with you or you would feel it hang up on the object, right? And so this new kind of 
control paradigm is something that we're actually trying to explore a lot more um, in our lab. Now, what do we find in terms of the control? Basically, um, if, if the video didn't give it away with the box, the uh, box and blocks, um, is that the beta controller worked better, right? Um, it worked better in terms of block transfer. You were able to transfer more blocks at a time, um, you know, with the beta controller than the alpha. Um, and it also um, had what we, uh, higher, what we called a block transfer efficiency, which is looking at the number of um, uh, you know how many times you had to activate uh, your EMG command in order to successfully pick up and move a block. And so here, um, the higher the number, the better the efficiency, which means you had less activations, um, you know, less EMG activations to successfully move a block. And what we found is that the beta um, uh, uh, device here had a higher uh, block transfer uh, efficiency as well. Okay, uh, this uh, uh, kind of last project that I'll talk about in the prosthetic space um, is really looking at this idea of when we look at kind of how we control our limbs. And here I'm just showing very much so extrapolated, uh, you know, our head, you know, uh, our spinal column and our limbs. And let's just say you're trying to pick up this, this green ball. Well, uh, you, we know that like within our brain, right, we have uh, um, you know, um, uh, motor and sensory cortex and all of our volitional commands that, you know, command that tells me to open and close my hand that comes out from the motor, co uh, motor cortex down the spinal column and then out to the peripheral muscles that open that cause the hand to open and close. Likewise, within the hand, we have a lot of sensory receptors that measure, let's say, the interactions with this green ball and pass that information out from the periphery, back up the spinal column to our sensory cortex for processing. Um, and this is kind of how volitional control really works. Um, at the same time, though, we've also got this other uh, you know, sensory motor loop that gets closed when sensory events happen at, um, with our limbs that then go right to our spinal column. But instead of going all the way up to the brain and closing the loop, um, a reflexive controller is sent from the spinal column back out to uh, the periphery. And this reflexive control we've all experienced if you've ever touched, for example, like a hot stove, right? You touch the stove and your hand jerks back even before your brain mentally processes that there was a, you touched a hot element, right? That's a very reflex of a loop. Or like if you've ever been to the doctor and they take the little reflex hammer and hit your knee and your knee jumps out, right? That's another reflex of style uh, controller. But we use both, right? The kind of example of like touching the hot stove, right? We use that, uh, imagine you're putting a hot object on, or you're putting an object on the stove, right? That's more of the volitional. And then you accidentally touch it hot and you jump away. That's the reflex. We use these all the time in our, our, our kind of holistic control. And so what we were interested in is, can we incorporate both of these um, into control of a prosthesis, this hybrid control scheme? Um, and so this is some work that my student Neha Thomas did. She's actually uh, presented it yesterday um, at the IEEE IROS uh, conference um, that she did while she was uh, studying abroad on a Fulbright fellowship at the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart, Germany uh, with uh, Professor uh, Catherine Kuchenbecker. Um, and what we were interested in is, can we build this hybrid control um, you know, both the volitional kind of feedback or loop, and then also the reflexive feedback loop into a prosthesis. And so what you see here is we've got this uh, mock, this prosthesis, and this is actually a commercial prosthesis, the Autobot Speed Hand, um, that we put now a contact sensor on that basically measures where you're making contact along this prosthetic finger. Um, and then we've got this pressure sensor that also measures how much pressure is being applied to the other finger. So like if you're gripping. And what we did is we took the contact location sensor and we mapped that to a vibrating actuator. Um, so the user could actually perceive through the vibration where they were making contact on the finger. So this is more of the volitional control loop. Um, then we took the pressure sensor information and we mapped that to two different types of autonomous controllers. One that it was controlling um, the, uh, um, uh, excuse me, one that was controlling a uh, slip. So if the object slipped, it would actually try to grip tighter. And then one that uh, was uh, what we called an overgrasp uh, controller, which kept the user from grasping too hard. Um, so we ran this study uh, where the user, it was what's called a reach to pick and place task, where they had to reach, pick an object up, um, and then move it to another location and put it down. Um, and we wanted to do this without direct vision. So we actually had them stare at a visual target. We used eye tracking glasses to make sure um, that they weren't. And then we tracked, of course, everything um, you know, using motion capture. Um, 
basically what you'll see here is that you know users got one point for picking the object up or a third of a point for picking the object up another point for moving it to the end bin where they were supposed to put it down and then finally a point for putting it down um, and so what you'll see in this video is an example of a person doing it in uh, uh, successfully in the case where they had the haptic feedback and the autonomous uh, reflexive style controllers um, now what did we find overall um, you know we found that um, what's interesting is that even without the haptics, users were successful. But when we added the haptics and this reflexive control in, we got more consistent performance, both in terms of the score that they use, that they reached, but then also how much, how long it took them to do the task. They were a lot more consistent. Um, and so overall, participants with this hybrid haptic plus uh, reflexive control um, were more accurate and took less time uh, to do the task more consistently than the groups without uh, either of these two things. Okay. I'm um, going to get close to wrapping up here. I'm just going to very quickly talk about the work that we're doing in the um, robotic minimally invasive surgery space. This is a work done by uh, my uh, graduate student, Sergio Mataka, a uh, former alum of the lab, Eric Cow, and another former, a former alum of the lab, Eric, uh, Amy Chi, as well as a former uh, um, a master student in the lab, uh, Guido Kashiniga. Um, so we know, or maybe you don't know, but now you, now you do, uh, the Da Vinci robot, which is kind of the standard clinical uh, uh, robotic surgery platform, doesn't have any haptic feedback. It is a tele-robotic system without haptic feedback, which means that users have to rely very heavily on their vision in order to be able to perform a task. Um, what we're interested in studying is what happens, what does this lack of haptic information do when it comes to skill acquisition, how they're able to actually learn how to control this device. Um, so what we've done is take, um, in, in this case, I'm gonna show you just a really quickly an experiment where we now said, okay, let's provide them some of this haptic information. So we put the training task, which is this ring roller coaster task where you move the ring along the track, on top of a force plate so that we can measure the interaction force. And we map that to these two little actuators that they wear on their wrist. Essentially, the harder the actuators squeeze, um, the less the, uh, um, or, or the more force you're actually producing. Um, and what we were interested in is, does the happy feedback allow them to perform the task more accurate, in this case, lower force? And what effect does that have on how fast they perform the task? And what we found is that, by and large, adding the haptic feedback in does allow participants to perform the task faster. I mean, excuse me, with lower force, right? As you can see with the red trace down here. Um, but it also um, does, uh, while it does increase their uh, the time that it takes them to do the task at the beginning, and here they did 12 trials, by the end, by the 12th trial, there's really no difference between the group that got haptics and the group that didn't. So what we're seeing is that this haptics does allow you to improve your task performance, and it doesn't penalize um, you in terms of the uh, you know the time duration of the task time it takes to do the task. This other experiment um, here was really looking at when you look at how clinical robotic training is done. A lot of it is done virtually, um, but most of the time people still consider the actual physical robot the gold standard. Um, and so we wanted to answer the question: Are these two platforms equivalent in terms of uh, skill learning? So my student Guido basically set out to build two different identical. Um, uh, uh, training platforms. It's all around needle driving, taking the needle and driving it through these little rings. I mean, we had a virtual and a physical analog. As you can see in this video here, um, we had the same input, which was used the Da Vinci Research Kit robot uh, that was used to uh, control both the virtual and the physical environment. And we were interested in um, kind of studying are these two platforms the same, essentially, in terms of uh, A, how does someone learn or develop skill? And then B, how do they transfer that skill to the other platform? Um, and so you can see that there was visual feedback here um, you know, that showed you your displacement if your needle driving trajectory was outside of the ideal trajectory. So we ran this experiment with 18 participants where we gave them a chance, we got baseline measures, we gave them a chance to train, um, and then we evaluated them all on the same platform. So half of the group did it on the real inanimate platform. The other half did it on the virtual platform. And then we crossed them over. Those that trained in, in, on the inanimate real platform, we had them do another performance on the VR. And those that trained in VR, we had them do another round of performance on the real platform. And essentially what we found, because we had them do it at uh, three different speeds, I'll focus in on the moderate speed, which is more akin to like what your natural, let's say, motion would be. We found that on both platforms, both the real and the virtual world, you got better, right? So if you look at the red bar to the green bar here, there's a significant reduction. And this is an error metric, so lower is better in this case. But what's interesting is that when you look from green, the green block to the blue block, only in the inanimate, which is the one on the left-hand side, did performance not change, which means that the skill that was developed in the real world transferred readily to the virtual world. 
The opposite is not true for the, vir the participants that train in the virtual world. Even though they got better from baseline, when we put them on the physical system, they got worse, um, significantly worse, actually. Um, and so what we're seeing here is that uh, these two platforms are just not exactly the same when it comes to skill. They may be the same when it comes to skill learning. They may not be exactly the same when it comes to skill transfer. Okay, and then really briefly, I'm just going to talk about uh, very you know quick two other projects that we've been working on, um, both of which have been you know uh, made possible just by the flexibility of the uh, uh, the Quantum DAC systems here. Um, the first is some work that we're doing down at the hospital with some uh, folks in the Department of Physical Medicine, Rehabilitation, and Neuroscience. Um, where we are building uh, some experimental, appar uh, um, experimental apparatus that allow us to study, um, you know, kind of fundamental neuroscience principles. Um, here we have a participant um, uh, who has a brain machine interface, uh, these cortical electrode arrays in motor cortex and sensory cortex. Um, and here we're actually trying to couple and, you know, with some of our fundamental perception work, the behavioral studies that we run with neural analysis, where we can measure directly from the brain. Um, and then this other experiment um, is one also run with a, a Q8 DAC, and you can see the Q8 DAC and the other one, um, where we're now looking at multimodality feedback. So what happens now when we give you two different types of feedback at the same time? There's evidence to suggest that it leads to improvements, but uh, um, we want to figure this out specifically looking at the case of robotic surgery and then also upper limb prosthetics. Um, and so with that, I will uh, stop here, um, you know, acknowledge all of the students um, that have been doing all the work in the lab, uh, uh, um, they give me great stuff to talk about. Um, you know, if you wanted to find out a little bit more about the work that we're doing, you can go to my lab's website uh, and you can find a link to all of the papers that we have. So I'll stop there and open up for, for any questions you may have. Thank you. Wow, what a um, fascinating presentation. <laughs> I need a, a bit of time to take it all in. Um, amazing work. Um, uh, so for everyone who's 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 um, uh, joined us live, this is a good time. If you have any questions for Dr. Brown, uh, please submit them through the uh, uh, questions pane. Um, uh, we're almost at the end of our, our time, so let me let's let's go to the first uh, question that's in. Um, one of the attendees is asking, um, how will your work in surgery be relevant uh, when surgical robotic platforms eventually add um, haptic feedback? Yeah, so I think that's a that's that's a great question. I mean, um, if anyone who's, who's you know if you've been in the, the surgical robotics field for a while now, you you know that um, you know uh, the adding haptics has kind of been thought of as the holy grail, right? Uh, um, and there are a lot of reasons why haptics is not on platforms like the DaVinci. Um, you know, what happens when haptics is added? I think what our work kind of shows is that, um, you know, and, and, and the work of others has shown is that haptics is a useful training tool. Um, and uh, um, I think our work will complement uh, in many respects, um, you know, thinking about from a motor learning perspective, what is the right information to be providing to a trainee, a novice trainee that doesn't have the skill proficiency, um, you know, in order to get them up to speed and get them on the learning curve and off the learning curve very quickly so that they can go out and actually perform the task, right? You know, you look at you look at open surgery, a traditional surgery with our own lips, right? That has maximal haptic feedback because you're using your intact hands here. Um, and there's still a training period that has to happen where you're learning these psychomotor skills. Um, and so we can think about haptics in that sense of like augmentation. How do I add additional information that you may not already be privy to that lets you be able to, to learn and perform the task a lot, uh, um, you know, build your skill up a lot more proficiently? Thank you. Um... Next question. Um, how does your work on um, on prosthetics compare to that of other researchers doing direct nerve interfaces or brain machine interfaces? Yeah. So, so um, uh, you know, yeah. There's a lot of work uh, going on now in the prosthetic space, looking at tapping directly into the nerves at the periphery, uh, tapping directly into um, um, you know neurons in in in, in uh, you know in cortex. Uh, the last slide that I, one of the last slides that I showed again was showing this BMI work as well. Um, I think there, um, you know, uh, what our work does is it answers this question of what is the right information that needs to be provided, right? Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, even whether, regardless of whether we're tapping directly into uh, the nervous system or, you know, we're using approaches like my lab does where we basically go over the surface of the skin um, and tap into the nervous system that way, um, you still got this information 
uh, transduction that happens from the sensors on the prosthesis to the user. Uh, and so a question becomes, you know, as a designer of a prosthesis, what is the right information to be sending at any given time? Um, and so a lot of the work that we're focusing in on is trying to understand what are the right haptic cues that need to be sent so that, you know, an amputee can properly close the loop. Because even with these peripheral interfaces or, 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 or cortical interfaces, um, you know, we still are going to have a dimensionality problem, right? Um, when you look at the number of sensors that innervate, um, you know, our fingertips versus the number of sensors that exist on, you know, even future prosthetic devices right now, we're orders of magnitude less, right? And so we're always going to be working with this, uh, you know, dimensionality reduced uh, sensory system. And so then it becomes, okay, with this reduced set of information, what is the most critical one that you need now to actually complete the task? Um, and that's, and then separately, you know, some of the work that we're doing with the uh, other prosthesis now, um, the other two uh, studies I talked about is one, how do we couple autonomy on a robotic system or a prosthetic limb with direct volitional control? Um, you know, this kind of shared control scheme. I mean, there've been examples of shared control in like autonomous vehicles and, and other things, but now we're thinking about like this pure human robot interface, right? Something uh, that's very intimate, like a limb. Um, how do you carry out this shared control paradigm where you want to do something with the limb and the limb has also got its own ideas about what it needs to do? And how do you get these two systems to work together? And then, and then finally kind of um, uh, with our, um, um, you know, this, this tendon driven device is thinking about uh, um, how do we couple more biomimetic control schemes like tendon driven devices where not only can you control actuation of the lens, but you can also do things like modulate impedance because it's been shown kind of that um, with our natural bodies, we modulate the impedance of our limbs kind of all the time to do different tasks. Um, you know, how do we uh, couple that type of control, right, which is a very, you know, kind of non, you know, very different than kind of clinical control paradigms now, how do we couple that with more advanced processes that do have haptic feedback and do have peripheral nerve interfaces uh, and the like. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's all the time we have um, for, uh, for questions. Um, uh, once again, uh, thank you to Dr. Brown for your time um, and wonderful presentation and a big thank you to everyone who attended uh, live today. Um, I recommend that you visit our website at www.quanzer.com to find out more about our numerous research validation uh, platforms, um, including um, our technology related to robotics, uh, haptics, and data acquisition. Um, and please don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn and uh, check out a collection of videos and tutorials on YouTube. Have a wonderful day and stay safe, everyone.